Greetings and thank you for joining me for a few minutes in my office as I share personally an invitation from my heart to yours. The Bible says that he was a sad and disappointed father. In Mark chapter 9, we're introduced to him as with exasperation in his voice, he appeals to Jesus in words that drip with desperation. Teacher, I brought you my son who's possessed by a spirit. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Moments later, a father rejoices as for the first time since childhood, he's reunited with a healthy, normal son. Puzzled as to why they could not cast out the demon, the disciples are reminded by Jesus that this kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. There would seem to be incredible possibilities when we choose to both pray and fast. It seems that in the days of Christ, early believers and even the early church regularly, of course, prayed, but also fasted. Why and when did they do so? Scripture tells us that in times of great need, God's people fasted. It shouldn't surprise us that Jesus chose to fast for 40 days as he left the baptismal waters to enter the wilderness of temptation. Paul and Barnabas fasted as they committed local elders to begin service to the Lord. And in Luke 2, at the time of the dedication of the infant Jesus at the temple, were introduced to Anna the prophetess, who we're told spent her life worshiping with, fasting, in prayer both day and night. Finally, Jesus expected his followers to fast and to do so with humility when he observes in Matthew 6, verse 16, and when you fast, do not look gloomy as the hypocrites do. Scripture suggests a number of important results that are possible as God's people fast. Biblical examples demonstrate that it was an aid to receive the gift of a humble heart, as well as an experience that helped clear the mind. The resultant gift of practicing a fast often led to understanding more clearly God's will in important matters, and it seems that the children of Israel would often choose to fast as they faced the threat of invading armies and the dangers that often landed right at their doorstep. Now, admittedly, everything I've noted takes place in an ancient land far away and in a very different period of time. I can understand someone observing that Today, we live in a different era, and we're at a time when studies tell us few committed Christians practice fasting anymore. Oh, we Christians pray, and we should, always. But Elder Haley, you're inviting us to pray and fast? Well, my response to that question might be, perhaps now, today, is a time unlike any other in recent memory, when God would call us to dedicate ourselves to both prayer and fasting. Why now? Why April 15? Why are you choosing that as an appointed day of prayer and fasting? All of us are painfully aware that we're living, surviving most days, through one of the most tumultuous and difficult extended periods of time in modern American history. Perhaps not since the opening days of World War II, or at minimum, the post-911 era, have our lives been so impacted so turned upside down than by the assault of the COVID-19 crisis. Every passing day brings more news of gloom and doom, and together in one strained voice, we would cry like the father of the demon-possessed boy, Lord, take pity on us and help us. For the same blessings the children of Israel experienced, for the same reasons Jesus commanded it, this is an hour for God's people to pray and fast that he would bless and deliver and see us through the crisis. We will call to God to grant us his mercies. We will call to God to deliver us from harm and evil and to bless his church and its mission, just as he will bless us individually as well as our families in a way that perhaps is only possible by experiencing his wonderful deliverance. So we've chosen April 15 when many medical and government experts believe is around the time that the crisis may be at its peak in the United States as a day for God's people throughout Kentucky Tennessee Conference to experience for at least one day, to devote themselves at least this one day to a time of prayer and fasting. Let me assure you there is power as we join together in this practice. 
There is power when we're united in raising our petitions to God. There is power and possibility and promise that God will hear and bless us. I trust you'll join me and thousands of fellow believers across this conference in experiencing the blessings of a day of prayer and fasting on April 15. God bless you.